Of the 2,000 radio and television interviews and specials that I conducted, the one that received the most attention had to do with a place called the Bermuda Triangle. Um, You can look that up. Others have said it was my best radio show. Original, compelling, mysterious, and just plain bewildering. Uh, I disassociate myself from those accolades. I simply interviewed a number of people who were in some way involved in a peculiar geographical area where dozens of ships and planes have mysteriously disappeared claiming the lives of hundreds over the years. I felt it was a good radio program, but fell short when it came to the issues of resolution. The reality of the disappearances are beyond debate, but the explanations still hang in the air right alongside the fact that the sea guards well her mysteries. During the course of the broadcast, I reported that a pilot who was less than two miles from landing in Florida sent out an emergency alert that his plane was going down. His instruments appeared to fail, and he repeatedly uttered the word Stendek over and over before the plane went down. Among the hundreds of letters I received and read, a woman had crafted a detailed analysis of the broadcast in which she hypothesized that long ago she read or heard of a game similar to chess played by some Greek mythological figures, and that game was called Stendek. I independently researched this reportage, as well as many others, but was never able to confirm her information. With a crew of 39, the Tanker Marine Sulphur Queen began its final voyage on February 2, 1963, from Beaumont, Texas, with a cargo of molten sulfur. Its destination was Norfolk, Virginia, but it actually sailed into the unknown. A routine radio message on the night of February 3rd placed the ship near the dry Tortugas. The 254-foot vessel was overdue on February 6th, and a search was launched for it. Planes took off from Coast Guard stations from Florida to Virginia, while cutters patrolled the Atlantic coast. When no trace was found, the search was abandoned on February 14th. Five days later, in the Florida Straits, 14 miles southeast of Key West, a Navy torpedo retriever picked up a life jacket and several bits of debris believed to have come from the tanker. Nothing more has been found. On August 28, 1963, two KC-135 four-engine Stratotanker jets took off from Homestead Air Force Base south of Miami, Florida on a classified refueling mission over the Atlantic. The crews total 11 men. The weather was clear. At noon, the planes radioed their position as 800 miles northeast of Miami and 300 miles west of Bermuda. The planes were new, in radio contact with each other, and they were not flying close together, according to an Air Force spokesman. Then, the planes vanished. An extensive search was launched. Planes crisscrossed the area in formation, following a carefully planned pattern of observation. Vessels churned the surface of the sea. On the following day, debris was discovered floating on the water about 260 miles southwest of Bermuda. No survivors or bodies were found. It was presumed that the two planes had collided in the air, but two days after the disappearance, more debris was located, but it was 160 miles 
from the first discovery. What happened remains a mystery. The mysterious menace that haunts the Atlantic off our southeastern coast had claimed two more victims. And during the past two decades alone, this sea mystery at our back door has claimed almost 1,000 lives. And not one body has ever been recovered. The United States Navy, Air Force, and Coast Guard investigators have admitted they are baffled. And the few clues we have only add to the mystery of a place we're going to explore this evening called the Bermuda Triangle. Okay, let's begin at the beginning. Draw a line from Florida to Bermuda in your head, and another from Bermuda to Puerto Rico, and a third line back to Florida through the Bahamas. Within this area known as the Bermuda Triangle, most of the total vanishments have occurred. This area is by no means isolated. The coasts of Florida and the Carolinas are well populated as well as the islands involved. Sea distances are relatively short. Day and night there is traffic over the sea in airlines. The waters are well patrolled by the Coast Guard, the Navy and the Air Force. And yet this relatively limited area is the scene of disappearances that total far beyond the laws of chance. Its history of mystery dates back to the never explained enigmatic light observed by Columbus when he first approached his landfall in the, in the Bahamas. The Bermuda Triangle underlines the fact that despite swift wings and the voice of radio, we still have a world large enough so that men and their machines and ships can disappear without a trace. Whatever this menace that lurks within a triangle of tragedies so close to home, it was responsible for the most incredible mystery in the history of aviation, the Lost Patrol. Here's the amazing story of that event. Early on a Wednesday afternoon, five TBM Avenger torpedo bombers lined up on runways at the Fort Lauderdale, Florida Naval Air Station. The date was December 5, 1945. Normally, the Avengers carried a crew of three, a pilot, a gunner, and a radio operator. One crewman, however, failed to report on this day. Dick, when we were talking a couple of days ago, you mentioned that you had come up with an extraordinary uh, man who was the man who refused to go on the Lost Patrol ill-fated flight. All right, let me tell you about that, Elliot. Please. As I told you, I researched the subject for two years before I exposed one frame of film. I researched this and hashed back and forth, and all of a sudden it dawned on me one day, how come when five planes took off, each one carries a crew of three, there were only 14 men aboard. What happened to the 15th man? So I started doing some checking. Nobody down here that ever served at uh, the Naval Air Station of Fort Lauderdale uh, knew what happened to him, and nobody ever gave it any thought why there was only 14 men. So digging a little further, I came up with a, a name of uh, L. Cosner. Repeat that name, please. Cosner. Right. C-O-Z-S-N-E-R. And uh, he... Uh, he is now a school teacher in the Middle West, and uh, I located him. It took me two months to locate him after I found his name, and uh, we brought him down here, and we took him to the old Naval Air Station barracks, and we filmed him in front of the barracks telling why he didn't take the flight that day. And I know you're, gonna, you're wondering now why he didn't take the flight, right? Yes. Let me just set that up again for our listeners, that on this particular day, the day that the Lost Patrol vanished, uh, over the Bermuda Triangle, 14 flyers went aboard to, to take their positions in this uh, in formation. One flyer that day decided not to fly, and he was, of course, the only man who survived. Now tell us, Dick, why he didn't go aboard. He had a strange feeling, just something said not to go. And uh, he couldn't explain it, he doesn't know why, but he just didn't want to go. Now, he wasn't required to go because he already had his required flight time in for the month, because in the service you have to have so many hours of flight time in to get flight pay. Mm -hmm. And he had already had it in, so he didn't have to go. So he went back to the barracks and went to sleep. The bombers had been carefully checked and fueled to capacity. 
The engines, controls, instruments, and compasses were in perfect condition, according to later testimony. Each plane carried a self-inflating life raft, and each man was equipped with a life jacket. All 14 men had flight experience ranging from 13 months to 6 years. At 2 minutes past 2 p.m., the flight leader closed his canopy, gunned his engine, and the first plane roared down the runway. The others followed in quick succession, climbing up into the clear sky and heading east over the Atlantic at 215 miles per hour. It was a routine patrol flight. The navigation plan for the formation was to fly due east for 160 miles, then north for 40 miles, then back southwest to the air station completing a triangle. The relatively short flight would require about two hours. The first word from the patrol came to the base control tower at 345, but the strange message did not request the expected landing instructions. Quote, calling tower, this is an emergency, the patrol leader said in a worried voice. We seem to be off course. We cannot see land. Repeat, we cannot see land. What is your position, the tower radioed back. We are not sure of our position, came the reply. We can't be sure where we are. We seem to be lost. Startled, the tower operators looked at one another. With ideal flight conditions, how could five planes manned by experienced crews be lost? Assume bearing due west, the tower instructed. There was unmistakable alarm in the flight leader's voice when he answered, quote, We don't know which way is west. Everything is wrong, strange. We can't be sure of any direction. Even the ocean doesn't look as it should. Close quote. Now let's suppose that the patrol had run into a magnetic storm that caused deviations in their compasses. The sun was still above the western horizon. The flyers could have ignored their compasses and flown west by observation of the sun. Apparently not only the sea looked strange, but the sun must have been invisible. During the next few minutes, the tower operators listened in as the pilots talked to one another. The conversation progressed from bewilderment to fear, verging on hysteria. Shortly after 4 p.m., the flight leader suddenly turned over flight command to another pilot. At 4.25 p.m., the new flight leader contacted the tower. Tower, he said, we are not certain where we are. We think we must be about 225 miles northeast of the base. It looks like we are... The message ended abruptly. That was the last word from the doomed patrol. Tower operators signaled a rescue alarm. Within a few moments, a huge Martin Mariner flying boat with full rescue and survival equipment and a crew of 13 men was on its way. I was stationed at Banana River Naval Air Station, which was a training base for patrol plane pilots at the end of World War II. From Miami Beach, Florida, Richard Adams, pilot of a PBM Martin Mariner flying boat, spoke with us about the events around December 1945 at the Bermuda Triangle. December 5th, which I remember very well. Uh, the war was over. Uh, there was no pressure on anybody. Uh, things were calm and peaceful until the night of December 5th, which I remember very well. I had just finished uh, training as a patrol plane commander at the uh, seaplane base there and had been transferred over to the utility squadron and the air sea rescue squadron, which was under the Coast Guard, when the, the uh, disappearance in the Bermuda Triangle occurred. I had finished duty for the day and gone home around 5.30, 6 o'clock, had dinner and gone to bed. <clears throat> when in the middle of the night there a, was a sudden pounding on our front door and with the duty officer telling me to uh, report immediately back to the base. And when I got there, it was somewhat mass confusion. People running in all directions, lights going on and off, and uh, everything was just kind of in, the, uh, kind of in, a, in a state of confusion in the ready room. Uh, the skipper arrived shortly of the uh, Coast Guard squadron, which I was in the Navy, but I was attached 
to the Coast Guard squadron. Uh, at our briefing uh, that occurred about, I'd say it was now about midnight that night, uh, it seemed that five torpedo bombers had taken off from Fort Lauderdale Naval Air Station on a routine training flight. They were due back sometime between 4.30 and 5 that evening, <coughs> but had failed to return, and they got a very mysterious garbled radio message from, for, from them saying they were in, in trouble. Our uh, ready plane was dispatched oh, sometime that evening before I reported to the base, and they hadn't had any reports from it. It had suddenly disappeared. So all of a sudden, we were confronted with five torpedo bombers that had disappeared with some 13 to 15 men aboard. And then when the rescue plane went out to try to find them, uh, it disappeared with 13 men aboard. These were all trained, experienced Navy flyers and enlisted men that had all been trained in the art of ditching a plane in the open sea and we couldn't understand what had happened or why we hadn't heard any distress signals. SOS, we uh, got something like each crew had between 11 and 15 men in each plane, and the uh, skipper advised me to take the first plane, as I was the only uh, trained patrol plane commander assigned to the Coast Guard at that time in this particular uh, uh, branch. So we took off the next morning, and uh, planned our approach to this area where the planes were last heard from them. <clears throat> and we searched for something like five days and five nights, and we saw absolutely <clears throat> no trace of a plane or a downed pilot, a life raft. Uh, in that time, I think there was something like several hundred planes that uh, were out there from the Army, the Navy, the Marine Corps. There were hundreds of service vessels that, uh, surface vessels that uh, surfaced all through the area. But uh, at the end of five days and maybe several hundred thousand miles of sea we searched, no trace was found of the planes or the men, and I don't know anyone that knows today what happened to them. What are your thoughts? What do you think happened to them? Well, frankly, there, uh, there is no explanation, no explanation that, that a sensible scientific person would, would try to explain. There just is no explanation. The tower tried to call the Avenger to tell them help was en route. There was no reply. Several routine radio reports were received from the Mariner. About 20 minutes after it left the base, the tower called the flying boat to check its position. There was no answer. What was happening out there over the sea, 200 miles away? By this time it was dusk. Alarmed, operations at Fort Lauderdale notified the Coast Guard at Miami. A Coast Guard rescue plane covered the flying boat's route and reached the last estimated position of the missing patrol. There was not a single sign of the six planes. Navy and Coast Guard vessels joined the search. Through the long night, they watched for possible signal flares from life rafts. But no lights broke through the darkness above the Black Sea. At dawn, the escort carrier Solomons moved into the area and dispatched its 30 planes in an aerial search. Within a few hours, 21 vessels were combing the sea. Above the ships were 300 planes flying in grid search pattern. The British Royal Air Force passed every available ship into service from the nearby territorial islands. And all during the day, the sky and the sea were methodically crisscrossed over an ever-widening area. The intensive search continued on the following day, not only between Florida and the Bahamas, but 200 miles into the Gulf of Mexico. Twelve large land parties searched 300 miles of shoreline from Miami Beach to St. Augustine. Low-flying planes checked beaches south to Key West and north to Jacksonville but not a scrap of wreckage or debris was found. Military experts were baffled. How could six airplanes, including the large Mariner, and 27 men totally vanish in such a relatively limited area? Mysterious, mystic, supernatural, unlikely. This area, commonly bounded by Bermuda, Florida, and Puerto Rico, 
might have on the surface what could be considered a high disappearance rate, but you also have to consider the amount of air and sea traffic of this section. Speaking to us from Miami Beach, Florida, United States Government Public Information Office, 7th District Coast Guard, Ron Wright. The majority of disappearances in this area can be attributed to its unique environmental features. First, the Gulf Stream, with its turbulence and swiftness, can quickly erase any sign of disaster. And second, the weather in the Caribbean Atlantic area, with its ability to change rapidly, can produce thunderstorms and water spouts without warning, making pilots and boaters face sudden catastrophe. The topography of the ocean floor in the area between San Juan and Bermuda varies from extensive shoal areas in the islands to some of the deepest trenches in the world. With the interaction of strong currents over many reefs, the topography is constantly changing and hazards to the mariner can be swift. There are some possible justifications for frequent accidents and so-called mysterious disappearances within this area, but the Coast Guard is not impressed with explanations from the supernatural. The combined, unpredictable forces of man and nature are sufficient enough to supply unexplainable occurrences. A problem we face here in South Florida is the large number of boaters transiting the waters between Florida's Gold Coast and the Bahama Islands. Too many times people will attempt to make the crossing with a boat too small, a lack of knowledge of the area, and a lack of good seamanship but they insist on trying, and that's what keeps Coast Guard Air Station Miami the busiest search and rescue unit in the world. When people show no respect for the sea and venture into it, the odds are against them. The Coast Guard feels there is nothing mysterious about disappearances in this particular section of the ocean. Weather conditions, equipment failure, and human error, not something from the supernatural, are what has caused these tragedies. Did the planes eventually run out of fuel while the Avengers were not especially buoyant, the Navy said that they would remain afloat long enough for life rafts to be launched and the crewmen shouldn't even get their feet wet. All the missing men were trained in sea survival procedures and had Mae West life jackets. After similar ditchings, Navy crewmen had existed for days, even weeks in open sea. Each plane had its own radio facilities. Why was no SOS received from at least one of the planes? Commander H.S. Roberts, executive officer at the base, suggested that his flyers might have been blown off course by high winds. The Miami Weather Bureau reported that there had been gusts up to 40 miles per hour in the general area where the patrol was last reported. These winds would not seriously influence flying. A water spout would affect only a low-flying plane. But if a freak water spout had struck the patrol, there would certainly have been debris. And what about the mariner? Did it meet the same fate as the patrol? All these theories disregard the puzzling circumstances reported by the flight leader, the curious observations and the strange inability to determine location. On the night of the disappearance, the SS Gaines Mills, a merchant ship, notified the Navy that it had observed an explosion high in the sky at 7.30 p.m., no wreckage or oil slicks were found at the location given, but the explosion occurred more than three hours after the last radio message from the patrol, and it is unlikely that there is a connection. Perhaps it could have been an exploding meteor. They vanished as completely, an officer of the Naval Board of Inquiry said, as if they had flown to Mars. Let's take a look at what else has happened in the area. There was the DC-3 passenger plane operated by the Airborne Transport Incorporated and chartered for a pre-dawn flight from San Juan, Puerto Rico to Miami. It was December 28, 1948, when Captain Robert Lindquist of Fort Myers, Florida, maneuvered the big airliner above the San Juan airport and headed for Florida, 1,000 miles away. The 32 passengers, including two babies, had been spending the Christmas holidays on the island. Ernest Hill, Jr. of Miami was co-pilot. Radar identification, turn right heading 030. Turning right heading Several hours passed. By this time, most of the weary passengers had fallen asleep in the now darkened cabin. Below the smoothly humming plane, 
dim in the starlight, the Florida Keys began to slip by. They were almost home. At 4.13 a.m., Captain Lindquist made his last contact with the Miami control tower. Quote, we're approaching field, he said. Only 50 miles out to the south, all's well. We'll stand by for landing instructions. And then suddenly, seconds later, it happened. It happened so swiftly that Captain Lindquist and his co-pilot had no time to send an SOS. It happened so close to the mainland that the lights of Miami could be seen as a glow in the night sky ahead. What is the doom that can strike a huge airliner so quickly, so close to home? What dread fate actually came to the men, women, and infants aboard the DC-3? It's a film about the ill-famed Bermuda Triangle where so many planes have failed to reach their destination. So many ships have vanished off the face of the earth and hundreds of yachts never returned to port. From Fort Lauderdale, we spoke with Dick Weiner, producer of a documentary film called The Devil's Triangle, and perhaps the foremost expert in the United States concerning the phenomena. I knew about it because I, f I was finding out so many different facts and things. It's like taking a multiple choice type uh, question and a high school or college examination. I am skeptical about a lot of these theories of UFOs out there in spacemen because I have to see something to believe it. What are your theories, Dick? Well, Elliot, it's um, a magnetic phenomenon. I don't know if you or your listeners uh, know what uh, compass variation is. Explain. You studied it in high school physics. The compass doesn't point to the true north. It points to the magnetic north. There are only two places on Earth where it points to the true north. Every place else, it points anywhere from... Uh, four to as much as 15 degrees away from the true north, depending where your location is in an east and west, easterly or westerly direction around the earth. Right. Now, you get off the coast of Florida, you have zero degrees variation. In other words, off the coast of Florida, the compass points to the true north. Now, as we move to the east and we get as far as Bermuda, we have seven degrees variation. In other words, the compass is pointing seven degrees away from the true north. Right. Now, if we go 180 degrees right through the center of the Earth, try to imagine a globe in front of you, right. of the Earth, and you go from this area, this so-called triangular area out here in the Atlantic, formed by Florida, Bermuda, and the Virgin Islands, where all these disappearances are taking place, go 180 degrees from the center of that triangle through the Earth, you come out in another triangular area off the coast of Japan. This tri uh, triangle over there is formed by Japan, the northern tip of the Philippines and Guam. Mm -hmm. Now, off the southern tip of Japan, you have zero degrees variation. The compass there, too, pointing to the true north. And off, uh, off of Guam, you have about seven degrees variation, the same as near Bermuda. And in this area formed by the Guam, the northern tip of the Philippines, and the southern tip of Japan, you have the same thing, ships and planes and yachts vanishing off to the face of the Earth. In fact, to a greater degree than you have here in the so-called Bermuda Triangle. And uh, you talk about this magnetic force. Where do, where do the ships and planes and people go? Well, I... <laughs> that's the one thing, see? Every theory <laughs> you can come up with, you come up with a contradiction, but a number of, of uh, victims have... those that were able to communicate had compass problems, uh, and some people have been out there and come back and had compass uh, problems. I have some interviews in my film of... Uh, boat captains and aviators that got out there and their compasses just started rotating like an electric motor was turning them around. Not the compasses, but the needles. So you're, the compasses. you're suggesting that there might be a magnetic, a magnetic force in the bottom of the ocean floor? No, I don't think it's that, uh, that way. I think it's something to do with the, uh, uh, the polar fields from the magnetic north. Now, are, uh, do you have any idea if these objects are like sucked out of the Earth's atmosphere or, or sucked into the ocean? Because there, there, there's hardly ever any debris or bodies located. No, there's very seldom any uh, debris found. Uh, there's a, I have a well-known clairvoyant uh, in my film, and uh, he surmises that it's something to do with the contraction and the expansion of the Earth from the heating beneath the sea, and from time to time it opens up and creates a giant vortex, a whirlpool, and anything 
within range of it gets pulled down, and airplanes under 10,000 feet get pulled down into it. And what clairvoyant was that? That's a man named Dykeshorn. He's a Dutchman. The pilots were veterans, well acquainted with the area. The U.S. Weather Bureau said flying conditions were ideal, that there were no likelihood that the plane had been forced down by bad weather. Again, there was a search. 48 Coast Guard Air Force and Navy vessels joined in carefully covering the area, fanning out from the plane's last reported position. In much of this region, the sea is so shallow that any object the size of a transport can be seen on the bottom. Again, planes crossed and crisscrossed the area, flying almost wingtip to wingtip. They watched for debris, for groups of sharks or barracuda. Eventually, the searchers scanned 310,000 miles of sea and land, including the Caribbean and Gulf areas, the Keys and the Everglades. Nothing was ever found. The limbo of the lost that claimed the DC-3 and its passengers was on no map chartered by man. Why the planes of the British South American Airways were especially plagued by disappearances is a mystery within a mystery. The company was merged a few years later with the British Overseas Air Corporation, that's BOAC. Earlier in 1947, one of its airliners, the Lancastrian Stardust, was on the London-Santiago route. It didn't vanish in the Bermuda Triangle, but in Chile, leaving behind a classic enigma of the skyways. The Stardust was due to land at the Santiago airport at 5.45 p.m. on August 2nd. At 5.41, Captain R.J. Cook, the pilot, radioed his arrival time. There was a brief pause, and then came the word, Stendek, loud and clear. The strange word was twice repeated, Stendek, Stendek, then silence. The stardust was never heard from again. No wreckage was ever found, nor has anyone ever explained the meaning of the cryptic word, Stendek. under the sea which have been reported by you know official sources and which have not been explained and in the middle of it we got into this uh, so-called Bermuda Triangle. From New York City uh, we chat with Ivan Sanderson author of the book Invisible Residence. It has very little to do with Bermuda except it points in that direction generally. Uh, it turned out in the end we're still going with research uh, turns out in the end to be one of twelve. In, in your personal opinion, Mr. Sanderson, what is behind all of this? Uh, well, we are beginning to think that there are areas where there is naturally, not all the time, but from time to time, there are time anomalies. Something goes wrong with our time. And uh, what actually happens is that these ships and planes and people and there's what else seem to sort of drop out of our time thing, do you see? Mm-hmm. Um, because it's mostly the uh, airline pilots and the um, other flyers who brought this to our attention. We tried everything else. We, we thought of ocean currents. Well, some of them are on land, some of these things. Then we thought of uh, gravity going wrong. Then we discovered a second kind of gravity, which had just been worked on. Then we tried uh, electromagnetic effects, you know, uh, but nothing, or meteorological, anything else, nothing seemed to fit except uh, airplanes, let's take planes because it's simpler, would go into this area at certain times and um, they'd come out either too soon or too late. And we had case after case like this with, I mean, they've got their official logs to prove it. In other words, while they were in, and they, some of them got buffeted about, 
Others simply the radio and everything went off completely and radar and uh, according to the time logged on the ground over which they were flying, you see all the seats, right. uh, they came out um, absolutely wrong. When sometimes the winds, um, everybody said, oh, uh, you just had a bad headwind or a, a hard a tailwind. But in these cases, the wind was all written down at the level they were flying and it was in the wrong direction too. That's fascinating. How much time did they lose? Well, um, the longest I think that we've had was six hours. So, in your in your opinion, the the mystery behind the Bermuda Triangle lies in a time gap. That's right. Uh, you put it very well. A time gap between our universe and another one, which may be in the same place, but at a different time. Do you think? In other words, a universe that's actually this planet also. Yeah. Th that's. That's an incredible theory. That's fascinating. Well, it was Einstein who put it up first of all. And he said that the probably, um, according to his uh, calculations, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, we were only one universe or space-time continuum, and that there should be an infinity of other ones, an infinity, on forever. Uh, some of them in a different place at the same time, some of them in the same place at, the, at a different time, and so on and so forth. And apparently there will seem to be places, when you have a, a globe like ours, a magnetic globe which is spinning in what we call space, Right. Uh, this sort of, just like gra gra there are gravitic anomalies, places where gravity pulls stronger than it should do, you know? Right. Uh, and there's the feeling that this network here could be places where time gets sort of stretched, or um, rather like bubble gum, you know what I mean? The next victim of the jinx was a ship, the Sandra, a freighter, 350 feet long, radio equipped, sailed from Savannah, Georgia in June of 1950 for Puerto Caballo, Venezuela. Heading south, she passed Jacksonville and St. Augustine along the well-traveled coastal shipping lane. There she disappeared as completely as if she had never existed in the tropic dusk just off the Florida coast. There was another futile search by air and sea. No debris or bodies were ever found in the sea or on the beaches. In October 1954, a U.S. Navy super constellation disappeared just north of the Bermuda area. There were 42 people aboard. Although the plane had two transmitters, no radio signals were received. There was no trace of debris or bodies, though hundreds of planes and ships searched for days. Commander Andrew Bright, head of the Navy's Aviation Safety Section, admitted that the Navy had no explanation for the disappearance. At that time, I was living in uh, Arlington Heights, Illinois, working at uh, our company's Chicago office. It was Christmas, and, uh, 1957. Said, Harvey uh, Conover's mother, father, took off in the family yacht sailing between Key West and Miami. They were to cross the Bermuda Triangle. They were never seen again. From New York City, Harvey Conover recalls the story. He departed, in Key, departed Key West January 1st of uh, 1958. And um, my parents had uh, gone down on a cruise on their 45-foot yawl, the Revenock, um, for a, a cruise in the Bahama Islands. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, they went down to Key West. Then... They departed in Key, departed Key West January 1st of uh, 1958. Mm -hmm. At that time, um, there was, uh, the weather reports were good. And within a few days, however, um, a very, very sudden storm uh, came about, broke out. Uh, the wind shifted from the uh, south-southeast at about 12 knots uh, to gale force in the opposite direction uh, to the north-northeast. Um, oh, well, they had gusts over 70 miles an hour in the Florida Straits at that time. At that time, it was reported to us, in fact, uh, the Navy was involved in the search, the Coast Guard, naturally, even the Cuban Navy at one point in time, and many private aircraft. We also had um, quite a number of volunteers uh, local Miami yachtsmen who volunteered as observers on these private aircraft. And the search extended 
um, all along the coast of Florida, well, uh, along the whole coast of uh, Cuba to the Yucatan Peninsula. And continued, we found nothing until uh, <clears throat> there was discovered, I would, uh, oh, I would think it was about January 3rd or 4th, the uh, small boat that uh, the Revenant carried. The Revenant was a 45-foot yawl, and this was a small dinghy that was carried aboard her. And this, this uh, boat was washed ashore in Jupiter Inlet, Florida. That was the only, um, only trace of the boat that we, uh, that we did see at all. Mr. Conover, who was aboard that yacht? Um, aboard the yacht was my uh, father, Harvey Conover, um, my mother, uh, Dorothy Jobson Conover, my brother, uh, Larry Conover, and his wife, Lori Ponsart Conover, then a friend, William Flugelman, uh, both, my, my brother was about 27 at that time, uh, his friend William Flugelman was 29. William Flugelman's, uh, wife had been aboard the cruise but uh, she was ill at Key West, and she got off the boat at that time and um, proceeded uh, by land up the Keys. So she was not aboard the boat uh, uh, when she was lost. In 1881 occurred the most incredible disappearance of crews on record. The Ellen Austin, an American vessel, was west of the Azores when she found a schooner that had been deserted for no apparent reason. Everything was in order, and there was evidence of a struggle. To claim salvage, a crew from the Ellen Austin was placed aboard, and the two ships started for port. Then a squall blew up and separated the ships. When the schooner was found, she was again deserted. The new crew had also vanished. Another crew was finally persuaded to go aboard. Again, a squall separated the vessels, and the schooner and the men were never seen or heard of again. Vessels found strangely abandoned in or near the Triangle during the present century include the Carol Deering that ran aground at Diamond Shoals, North Carolina in 1921, the John and Mary discovered 50 miles south of Bermuda in 1932, and the Gloria Kalite of St. Vincent, British West Indies, found in 1940. Fourteen months before the disappearance of the Navy patrol from Fort Lauderdale, the Cuban freighter Rubicon was sighted by a Navy blimp off the coast of Florida near Miami with only a dog aboard. It was in perfect condition, with the personal possessions of the crew intact. Total disappearances of vessels have been more frequent than mystery derelicts beginning with the schooner Beta in 1854. In 1880, the British Atlanta, a training ship, sailed from Bermuda and vanished with 250 cadets and sailors aboard. In 1918, there occurred within the Triangle the most amazing disappearance of a vessel in American naval annals. This was the USS Cyclops, a Navy supply ship, 500 feet long with a 19,000 ton displacement. When she sailed from Barbados, British West Indies, on March 4th for Norfolk, she had 309 members of a crew aboard and a cargo of 10,800 tons of manganese. The weather was excellent. No radio messages were ever received and no trace of the wreckage was ever found. Well, we were down there quite some time and then I, w I was detached down there, sent to another ship. And, and I was in, uh, in Bahia, Brazil, when Carl Nervig is 81 years old. In 1918, he was a member of the crew of the USS Cyclops. And I was in, uh, in Bahia, Brazil, when, when the Cyclops came in on her way home. I see. And, uh, and that is the last I saw of her, in her. And it was on the way back from Brazil that the ship went down? That's right, that's right. Did you know many of the people aboard the ship? Oh, yes, I knew practically. I knew knew all the officers and quite a few of the crew. There were... When we left, at, 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 when I left him at the gangway, he held out his hand to, to, 
that I held up my hand, he took my hand in both of his and says, well, goodbye, old man. God bless you. I mean, it had kind of a, well, it hit me at the time as something kind of strange. And that is, of course, the last time you ever, you ever heard from him. Do you have any idea why he said that to you, Mr. Nervig? No, I, <coughs> I just, uh, I don't know. It's kind of a st strange thing. I mean, just very emotional. The sea guards well her secrets. Periodicals and reference sources used in preparing this report for KLOS on the Bermuda Triangle include the following. Dispatches from United Press International and Associated Press and the New York Times News Service. The book, The Mystery of the Lost Patrol by Alan W. Eckhart, American Legion Magazine, April 1962. The book, The Flying Saucer Conspiracy by Major Donald E. Kehoe. The book Stranger Than Science by Frank Edwards. Project Magnet is explained in a folder issued by the U.S. Navy Hydrographic Office, Washington 25, D.C. UFO Investigator, September 1963, published by the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena. The Journal of the Ottawa UFO Club, Spring 1963 issue. Sea Mystery at Our Back Door, an article by George X. Sand, which appeared in Fate magazine, October 1952, and an AP feature roundup of Bermuda Triangle disappearances by E.V.W. Jones, released at Miami, Florida, on September 16, 1950. Strange Mysteries of Time and Space, by Harold T. Wilkins. The Case for the UFO, by M. K. Jessup. Further information from a Fate article of October 1952, and the books of Charles Fort. The disappearance of the USS Cyclops is discussed in practically all articles and books on missing ships. Associated Press had a feature story on the mystery released at Boston on March 2, 1958. Two books, Posted Missing, and Sea Dogs of Today by Alan J. Villiers present excellent accounts of missing ships. And finally, additional material came to us from the Library Research Service of the Encyclopedia Britannica, Chicago, Illinois. This is KLOS Los Angeles. My name is Elliot Mintz, and you've been listening to a one-hour special that I put together this week called Stendek about the Bermuda Triangle. The engineer, by the way, on that recording is Roger Latham, who did an extraordinary job. Roger Latham in helping me put all of that stuff together. And, of course, thanks go to uh, all of the people who I spoke with to make it happen. I hope that put your head in a place where you like to be. We'll come back in a little while, and we'll spend the rest of the night on the telephones probably talking about it. <laughs>